Okay, great, thank you. So this is uh, Senate Education Committee on Tuesday, June 23rd. Um, I'm Debbie Ingram, I'm the Vice Chair of the committee. Um, our Chair, uh, Senator Baruth, is um, uh, in another meeting, um, it, but he will, he will join us. He asked me to go ahead and uh, get started though so we could start on time. Uh, so today we're hearing testimony about uh, COVID-19 testing funds for independent colleges. And I, I will let uh, Senator Hardy just kind of give us a little background since uh, this pertains to um, something that she brought up in committee last week. Senator. Great, well, thank you, Senator Ingram. Um, well, thank you all for coming to testify and I look forward to hearing, uh, in getting introduced and hearing from you. Um, I'm Senator Hardy um, from uh, the Addison District and um, I brought up this issue because I was serving on what we called our transitions work group, which was a work group of senators looking at issues surrounding transitioning back to a new normal or whatever people are calling it these days. Um, and I was taking the lead on education issues. And so I spoke with both um, Ted Brady and Rich Snyder, who are sort of leading some of the efforts at the state level about reopening institutions of higher education. And they both mentioned testing and resources for testing as an issue that the state doesn't have the capacity to test all of the incoming students. Um, so uh, I, we have, as a legislature, provided um, you know, funding for the state colleges and UVM. Um, and a lot of that will, or some of that is to be at, for their response to COVID but we have not provided funding to the independent colleges. Um, and I also personally, I live in Middlebury and represent Middlebury College. Um, and it's a concern for the residents of Middlebury that will have hundreds of students coming back from around the world and around the, con uh, the country and may not have the capacity to test them all. Um, so from the public health perspective, um, uh, it's really important to my constituents and I'm sure to constituents, people around the state who live in towns um, and cities that host your institution. So that was sort of my angle. So I've been advocating for funding for testing and some PPE, associated PPE, so that you all will be able to test students as they return to your campuses. So that's the background. Thank you. Great, thank you. All righty. Uh, okay, so I think we'll just, I'll just go down the, uh, the list uh, that I have here. So that would mean starting with um, Susan Stightley from um, AVIC. Welcome, Susan. Uh, thank you, thank you, and thank you for having us today. I'm just gonna be introduce everyone right now and I'll be on, I want you to hear from the presidents first and then uh, I can answer questions at the end. We have Tom McHenry, who is the president and dean of Vermont Law School, who's the AVIC chair. Uh, Matthew, President Matthew Durr from Sterling College, which is uh, our smallest institution. Uh, Laurie Quinn, uh, the interim president at Champlain College, and Mark Anarumo, the new president from Norwich uh, University. I just want to mention one thing, you know, we talked about testing and PPE, but I didn't think about the, app, the apps that the colleges are trying to get, which are turning up so that students can have self-testing or be tested every day uh, for symptoms. So that is turning out to be a big expense. And actually President Arumo from uh, Norwich will we talk to that um, at the when it's his turn. So I will turn it over to Tom McHenry to get started. Tom, you're uh, yeah. muted. Yeah, you're still muted. Alt A to unmute your microphone. Let me try that, <laughs> Alt A. Yeah, we can. Oh, there that. we go. I think my our host unmuted us. So, um, Senator Ingram, Senator Hardy, members of the committee, thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us on this important subject. Um, we, I am the president and dean of Vermont Law School, as you know, an independent law school located in South Royalton, Vermont. We have approximately 550 um, full-time uh, residential students. And interestingly, most of our students do want to come back to the campus in the fall, even if a number of our classes will still be offered virtually. And about 130 um, online students, a, a group that is uh, growing. And we are, Senator Hardy actually made my case for me because she pointed out uh, we have the same set of um, interests, um, perhaps even more compelling in the small town of South Royalton, not as many people as Middlebury, but our, we have no dormitories at Vermont Law School. 
Um, one of the few times we've actually been happy not to have dormitories was during the COVID outbreak. Um, so all of our students live in apartments in and among our um, residents, and they live as far away as, uh, you know, Bethel, White Rebel Ju Junction, Heartland, you know, in the surrounding areas of Windsor and Orange County. And we even have a few students who commute from places like Barry and um, Waterbury, Montpelier and uh, Burlington, as well as some towns in New Hampshire. Um, so, you know, the health of our students is, of course, paramount to us, as well as our staff and faculty. Um, but so is the health of our community. And of course, this is Vermont. We have a lot of older people in our community. Our students at Vermont Law School come from uh, all 50 states. I think a year ago, we had students from 41 of the 50 states and 11 of the 25 countries where our alumni currently um, work. Um, so it's a very mixed group. We, we expect, of course, many of our international students will have to participate virtually in the fall. But as I'm sure you know, and Senator Hardy knows, because she's looked hard, hard at this question, um, the, the problem we face is that uh, we're going to have to do some form of testing, and testing at the moment is quite expensive um, and uh, time-consuming, and uh, we need to line it up ahead of time. My understanding, and I have this from Senator Leahy's staff and Senator Wel and Congressman Welch's staff, is that the federal money that was made available to the state was made available for the purpose of allowing testing and that that was not in any way limited to um, public um, universities um, and state colleges. Um, so it seems to me only fair that we would be receiving um, support um, to do that testing. Um, I'm happy to go into any of the specifics of you know, the challenges of bringing people back on campus, you know, during a relative, you know, relatively the same amount of time, getting them properly tested, and then the issues that arise if we have a COVID outbreak, which we certainly hope we won't, and how to do the testing separately. But my guess is that, you know, you read the newspaper like I do, and you're well familiar with those issues. So maybe better if I stop there, you see if you have any questions for me, and then we'll go on to... Um, uh, the other members of speakers. And I apologize, I won't stay on for the whole committee meeting because we are right in the midst of our annual faculty reviews. And um, some of these faculty reviews have actually been scheduled with our faculty members uh, a month ahead of time. And they'd be terribly upset if I, if I wasn't on the call with them. So um, let me see if people have any questions for me. And I don't, I'm not sure I have the format of how you want to do it, but I'd be happy to try to respond to any questions. Thank you. Um, uh... It's probably Dr. McHenry, I would imagine. Um, uh, I, I do actually uh, wonder, have you been doing testing um, prior to this? Uh, has that been going on? We have not. We closed our campus on the 16th of March. By the way, I'm not actually a doctor unless you call a Juris Doctor a doctor degree, okay. which, which the legal community the legal community did so they could get a higher GS rating years ago. But uh, just Tom is fine. Um, uh, so when we closed our campus down, we are we remain shut down. I got my own nasal and blood test um, and talked my way into it at, at the urgent care in uh, West Leb, um, just so I could make sure that I was clean. But um, uh, we've we've not done any at this point. But we are looking at various providers of the testing, and you can be assured if we receive the funding that we are going to be um, very careful about spending that money wisely. We'd be starting to spend it um, like Susan can respond to this too, but probably we're talking about um, uh, mid August would be the beginning of that date. Okay, mid to late you. August. Other questions from the committee? Nope. Okay, well. Um, Great. Okay. I'll, I'll thank you. I'll stay on as long as I can. And thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you for coming. So, um, Susan, I get is Matthew Durr next? Well, I want to echo um, the appreciation to just have have your time. Um, and I don't ordinarily sit around my own home in a jacket and, and tie, um, but I'm a, a, a member, a, a commissioner of the New England Association of, of, of higher colleges in higher education. And, um, you know, this is a conversation that, that folks in your role across New England are, are having. And I think one of the common themes um, that I'm hearing and that we cer certainly feel right now at, at Sterling is the need and, and desire to partner with state government um, to preserve public health. Um, we're concerned about our campuses, we're concerned about our students, we're concerned about our employees. 
Um, but I think every one of the private colleges in Vermont also cares deeply about the community in, in, in which they're embedded. Um, for, for Sterling, um, what we talk about when we talk about the college is our, our commitment to uh, studying a sense of place and that place matters to us. Um, the, the town of, of Craftsbury, uh, Orleans County is our, our living laboratory um, and it is, our, it is our campus. If you drive through Craftsbury Common, there's one Vermont Historical uh, Association sign that says Sterling College on it. You cannot tell our white clabbered houses that are academic buildings from our neighbors white clabbered um, homes. Um, and so we are a part of this community. And I think, um, again, my colleagues at the other colleges would say similar things about their own uh, uh, campuses. And so to, to think about that, that partnership, I think is, is important. And in ordinary times before all of this happened, you know, our role in the state uh, was to prepare people to understand the working landscape of, of Vermont. So our, our mission is uh, ecological thinking and, and action. Our graduates are working uh, across agriculture and outdoor education and, and fields that are really critical to the economy uh, of Vermont. And the only way we can provide that education is to bring them to Vermont. And so about a third, a little more than a third of our students are Vermonters. Uh, the majority of the re remaining students are from across New England and a, uh, a few from across uh, the nation. And they've chosen this college uh, because they want to be in Vermont. And our hope is that they will want to stay in Vermont. And so um, to be able to do that, we've, we've developed elaborate plans uh, to have them here on our campus, to have them in pods um, of about 12 students that are socially isolated from each other. Um, we are uh, two blocks from Craftsbury Academy. If you, if you think of a Vermont block, it's a pretty short distance. Um, and so we're taking our village into consideration in the way that we're actually designing the social experience of our students. And Susan mentioned at the beginning that um, Sterling is the smallest college in, in Vermont. Um, our enrollment is intentionally limited to 125 students. Um, and we have 55 em employees. You, you can do that ratio. We're investing a lot in uh, philanthropy to be able to create this, this program. And we want to make sure that we continue to have balanced budgets and we want to make sure that the college is here for the long run. And as, as we look at this partnership, hopefully with the state and this funding through the CARES Act, we're looking at $160 a test, uh, 175 people. Um, that's about a half, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a good chunk of, of the number of our positions every year um, to, to be able to do a round of testing. And so we've been grateful for the, the guidance and the advice the state has provided to this point, and we're gonna continue to work closely uh, with you. And we hope that um, as, as Tom has shared, um, that, that uh, funding will flow to these independent colleges so that we can do the right thing by our communities and afford to be the kinds of colleges that, that do good um, work for the common good for, for the state. I'm happy to take questions. I, I have um, quite literally snuck out of a commission meeting to, to be here with you. So I'll answer whatever questions you have, and then I'll just change the configuration of faces that I'm staring at to another group in about 10 seconds. Uh, but uh, I can stay for as many questions as, as you have and appreciate them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Senator Hardy. Uh, thank you. And uh, President Durr, I, I, heard great things about Sterling College. I also serve on the Ag Committee. So um, you're, you come up uh, several times in there, or your college does. So I'd love to visit at some point. But um, I'm really curious, I'm interested in the pods uh, design that you came up with and wonder if your students live in dorms or do they live out in the community like um, they do at the Vermont Law School? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, our scale allows us to do things that I think would be challenging at, at some of the other colleges. But um, what we essentially have done is to reorganize our, our residence halls. So 90% uh, of our students live on campus. 
um, uh, the students who are on campus will be eating together. And, and you may know we're also a, a federal work college. So all of our students who live on campus um, also do work on the farm um, and do labor around the college. Um, when they do that, that labor, they will do it in the same pod with which they're living, pod membership, and studying. And uh, we are assigning vans and we're doing all of the work that, that we can to increase resources to, to be able to keep those pods segregated. Um, with the uh, period of the semester has been broken into two five week blocks. So students will switch pods between uh, from one to the next after, after that five week period. We'll do testing um, in between. And as, as Susan mentioned, we'll be do routine health checks and wellness checks um, for for students um, even in those those pods so um, we we have more experience perhaps in this because we um, have run field programs for a very long period of time and so we're basically adapting our field approach to uh, our campus mm -hmm. wow that's really interesting and um tom how many students are at vls i can't remember You're muted. You're muted, Tom. There we go, yeah. So we have about 550 residential students. We have, a, 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 um, as normal students, um, and then we have about 120, 130 online students. We also have a number of students who come from other schools during the summer. This summer, we're entirely virtual, so it's not applicable. Um, who would come for a two or three week course or sometimes even a weekend course like my forest law and policy course. So that's the, the mixture. And I say about 75% um, of them live within a mile or two of campus in downtown South Royalton, Royalton more generally, and then maybe the other 25% spread around the surrounding areas. Thanks. Thank you both. Right. Any other Thank questions? You. for Well, thank you. Yes, we appreciate hearing from you. Thank you so much. I appreciate being able to have the opportunity to talk with you. Um, so I guess it uh, looks like Lori Quinn uh, from Champlain College, my neck of the woods, uh, is up next. Thank you very much, Senator Ingram. And um, good afternoon, Senators. Um, special note of thanks to Senator Hardy for your leadership on this issue. Um, it's really important to all of us um, as, as college leaders to make sure that we're um, leveling with you about the extent of concern, what's waking us up at night these days. And um, frankly, the concern for our communities as our students begin to return to our campuses, whatever, however we're situated around the state, um, is certainly one of those topics um, that is uh, foremost in mind as we think about um, the implications of our responsibility to our communities. Um, and we certainly see um, the potential for some funding to help with testing um, it, as part of our obligation to uh, those communities. And um, as many of you know, here in Burlington, Champlain is really nestled uh, right in the community. Um, we are uh, in the Hill neighborhood. We are um, not even particularly distinct from UVM in the way that our buildings are laid out. And so uh, like our much bigger friend up the hill, um, we, are, um, we are really interspersed in this community. Um, you know, when I walk my dog and um, am out on the sidewalks with my family, um, I'm seeing Champlain students uh, right next to uh, members of this community, uh, folks of all ages who um, I think right now are quite concerned about what uh, the, the two Burlington-based colleges are doing um, to protect their health. And when I think about the extraordinary work that my team is engaged in now at the college, um, really working night and day to think of every detail that will keep our community, our students, our faculty, and our staff safe, um, and when I think about the, the very real um, financial hit that our institution is taking, um, the fact that Champlain, after um, a living memory of no budget deficits, um, will now have a budget deficit and a significant one um, that our board and our leadership is committed to managing down, um, I really want to emphasize to you the, the urgency um, of, of our request to you today. 
Um, and I want you to know that um, the hard work that we've done at Champlain over more than a decade now to have really strong relationships with our community citizens, um, I have worried that that may be put at risk by the potential perception um, that we're not doing everything we can uh, to keep that community and Vermont's hard won progress safe. Uh, so we're deeply committed, as my colleagues have said, deeply committed to using uh, this funding wisely and well and, and promptly uh, because our, our time is ticking in terms of the ability to have all of the level of preparation in place um, that we believe to be necessary to, to safeguard public health and make sure that those, um, those trusting relationships that we at Champlain have built with our community and our neighbors um, are not compromised at this incredibly critical time when we need to be uh, in deep partnership with our community, not, uh, not at odds because of perceptions that we haven't done our utmost uh, to make sure that student testing is front and center, to make sure that all of our uh, physical distancing plans um, are known to our community. So we want to do a good job sharing that information with folks um, so that they continue to have confidence in Champlain. Um, and would really appreciate your, uh, your support in, in that important work. Happy to hear any questions you have. And you've gone to remote learning, um, is that right? And when, when do you anticipate um, having students actually come back on campus? Yeah, our semester, uh, uh, our spring semester went remote on March 11th. Um, and uh, fortunately for us at that time, we were on spring break. So uh, the decision was to extend the spring break and then uh, we informed our students um, that we wanted to pivot uh, to remote instruction to complete the semester. Um, and our academic calendar resumes again at the end of August. So um, we will begin a phased move in in keeping with the state guidance that we've received from Dr. Levine um, and being able to test, as, as Tom said, uh, being able to test during that critical window um, and to do that without, um, without further uh, tunneling into that deficit budget will, will make a profound difference, I think, to our community. Okay. Minnie, yes, Senator Hardy. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Quinn. I assume you're a doctor. Um, yeah, yeah. You're welcome <laughs> to call me Lori. I, I answer to most things. Thank you, Lori. Um, so you have a phase move in. Are you expecting all of your students to come back or are you doing a sort of uh, de-densification plan with your calendar? And how many students um, are there at Champlain? I can't remember. So we are just right around 2,000 students in residence on the Hill. And um, fortunately for us, uh, our fully online population of right around 2,500 uh, does not uh, have access to campus. It's a, it's a fully asynchronous model. Um, so for the 2,000 or so who are uh, based uh, in res halls, a small number are uh, based in the community directly. But of course, our res halls and the, um, the housing in the community are virtually indistinguishable, like, like some folks have referred to in the smaller communities. Um, and so what we are looking at is um, a change to our academic calendar, which would send students home um, at the Thanksgiving break. Uh, so we will not have our normal two days of fall holiday in order to keep students um, you know, confined to the campus um, and also reduce our uh, likelihood of a convergence of the flu season, uh, worse timing with uh, coronavirus concerns. Um, so we have made that decision that the final three weeks of our semester uh, in the fall will be remote. And um, the phase move in uh, that you asked about is looking like we're still working on the, on the most uh, detailed aspects of it. Um, but effectively, it's making sure that we can implement physical distancing and uh, face coverings and all of the other appropriate precautions in what is normally a very crowded process of move-in. And so that, that has required us to get much more creative about the way that that's scheduled. Um, we expect to begin with students who are coming from the counties that uh, are green on that all, uh, indispensable map, um, and then to work from there. Um, and we are, we are studying now um, how will testing fit into that protocol, right? 
Um, and so this conversation is, is, is particularly timely today. Um, and I would just uh, ask the committee to do, to do what you can to, um, to, to help us in, in accessing these funds. It would make a huge difference to our, to our confidence in our planning. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I see Senator Bruce has joined us, so um, I will turn it over to him. We have one more witness to hear from, um, Senator. I, I will turn it back over to Debbie in just a second and let her finish the, um, the movement of the witnesses. I just want to apologize. I had another call I had to be on, but I did want to say that um, the intention of today, and Debbie may have already said this, is to create a record and to document the need for these funds. My hope is that the committee can generate a letter out of this where we summarize the testimony and send that to the chair of appropriations, health and welfare, uh, probably economic development, and also to the joint fiscal committee and just make sure that all the bases are covered uh, and that if we're not in session, the Joint Fiscal Committee will, in a sense, have our testimony in front of them. So uh, again, sorry for showing up late, but uh, Senator Ingram, why don't you just uh, continue? Okay, thank you. Um, so um, it, unless there are any other questions of uh, Lori? No. We'll move on to Mark Anarumo from Norwich University. Right, sir. <laughs> Yes, good afternoon. I'm assuming you can hear me all right? Yes. All right, uh, yes, I'm a doctor, but uh, and I'm a colonel, and apparently I'm a two-star general in the Vermont militia, but I will just go by Mark, and everyone's welcome to, to refer to me that way, please. So I'm representing Norwich University. I've been in the seat for a hot um, four weeks now, which is a, this is an interesting time to arrive and take over the seat, obviously. I'm actually driving right now. We pulled over for a moment. Uh, the director of development and I were on our way to visit some trustees. We were summoned for, uh, for something. So we're sitting in the car, but we should maintain the signal. If I drop, I'll call you right back. Thanks for letting me back in. Uh, so obviously we're committed, like everyone else is, fully to opening and operating safely uh, as an in-resident experience here. Uh, Northfield, you know, I came out for my campus visits back in Back in uh, would have been uh, January was the last time I was here, and I saw this thriving little downtown. And of course, now it's uh, boarded up and it's shutting. The town really support really uh, relies upon the presence of Norwich and a thriving Norwich to survive. And it's um, it's been a sad time to arrive, but we're fully committed to supporting a local community in that way, in a very safe way as well. Uh, of course, the vast majority of our employees they live in a local area. They want to be safe. They want to be good neighbors. As as we want to ensure uh, a neighborly existence for ourselves. You know, as a university, we specialize in experiential education. And if you keep up with the liter literature, it's that's the best way to reach this current generation of college age learning learners. And uh, obviously that relies heavily on in-person um, instruction, especially with the model we have as a senior military college for our core structure. You know, we are a national school. We uh, rely heavily on international partnerships. So uh, not being able to test efficiently due to fiscal constraints would definitely hurt our relationship with other uh, with other governments and that international community that we think is a very additive population to bring into uh, Vermont as a state. You know, we did develop a plan very deliberately with uh, Paulette Thabeau, who is our director of nursing, who also has a degree in law, in addition to a PhD in nurse practitioner, uh, which is a remarkable degree set. And uh, also Dr. Tim Partridge of the Central Vermont Medical Center. He also helped inform our plan for uh, testing and potential treatment of quarantine. So we developed something very formal and, and we think very well defined and very mature. Um, we are we have internal testing plans that we're finalizing. We have an on-campus infirmary. We're going to lean on the local, the Green Mountain family practice, which is actually on the campus itself and the local pharmacy. And it will bring out from there if, we, if we're required to. So we do have a pretty well-defined um, system we're going to have for testing. Uh, but we do need the funding help, obviously. You know, we're looking at uh, doing a single test for everyone on campus, faculty and staff. We're already in a half million dollar range, which is going to really hammer our budget pretty badly. And if we want to do uh, monthly, we're almost at $2 million. So uh, how to do this testing in a fiscally responsible way is obviously um, something that we're that's on the forefront of our mind. Uh, and just to anticipate the question that's coming, uh, we are looking at a phased return, uh, very well developed. It's gonna be a staggered schedule. 
uh, every few days from August 11th through August 30th. And we're defining exactly who's coming back. Student leaders first and athletes, then upper class students, then our freshmen, then civilian first year students, et cetera. So we're building out the plan and publishing it to our students about exactly who will arrive when to avoid having a concentration on campus and also convincing parents that one family member per student is desirable to um, reduce any kind of concentration of, uh, of human contact. So that's what I wanted to share initially. I look forward to meeting all of you personally. I'm sorry that this is our, our first introduction, but I look forward to uh, getting to know each of you. And with that, I'll take questions. Great, thank you. It's like Senator Bruce and then Senator Perchley. Uh, thank you. Colonel, was it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's multiple times, but Mark is fine, sir. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> respect to you, but I'll, I'll go with Mark. Um, so I'm wondering about the phased return. I think that that makes sense. Am I correct that it involves a certain amount of quarantine for each phase? So the 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 first students who come come in are in effect quarantining before the next wave comes in yes it's a very good observation so the the purpose is to bring them in give the test and their test results should be available before the next round comes in so that we can know how to house them more responsibly so it won't necessarily be quarantine it'll be it'll be more aggressively distanced and as more come in we can put folks together or keep them apart based upon testing sequencing and results as they arrive. We actually uh, purchased a home right across the street from my house, the president's quarters, I should say. And that'll be where we've, uh, that we've already designated that for positive tests for, a, uh, for quarantine. If the medical professionals advise that they should stay until the uh, virus runs its course in whatever situation they have. But yes, to your point directly, by phasing arrival, we can keep them sequestered until the results come back. And you know, it's interesting, I, my son is a cadet at the Air Force Academy in Colorado. That's exactly what they did and it's working to very good effect. By staggering arrival, they were one to a room until they can put them back when test results come. And that makes, uh, again, good sense. Uh, I am a little, um, the, the numbers that you talk about in terms of your costs, when I think about the overall estimate that Susan Stitely gave us, is, is 4 million still the, and again, apologies for missing the first half an hour, but is 4 million still the sense of what the independent colleges need out of the COVID funds? And, and maybe it's a question as much for Susan. Yeah, I think that would be, I was gonna ask Susan that myself, so yes. Uh, you know, it's only an estimate uh, and I had forgotten and I'd like Mark to talk a little bit about this about the apps and he's looking at one that would daily check temperatures so that is an additional cost so those are turning out to be very expensive whether it's a self-administered app that a student would have on their phone uh, but it, it, the one estimate we got would be six thousand dollars per year per student uh, Mark is looking at a different kind of temperature check. So if anything, I would think that um, 4 million is probably underestimated, but you know, it should, uh, I would ask that it be for any COVID related expense that relates to health and safety of the students, the campus community and the towns in which they're located. Because I think there's other things that we could use that would really protect uh, the towns and the campus community like these apps and the temperature checks. Mark, you want to talk a little bit ab about the um, company that you've had a discussion with and the cost and what it does? Yes, absolutely. So uh, to the numbers, you know, we're going to have higher costs, but I think I can speak for most of us that anything to offset the cost will be most welcome. And I think Susan's exactly right, that the cost is much higher than um, we're anticipating, but and even a, a proportion that will be an offset will be uh, tremendously helpful to our operating budgets, obviously. And to uh, Susan's comment directly, you know, there are temperature check um, stations 
And actually, Vermont Security, which is right there in Montpelier, is actually uh, advertising these two. They're actually called temperature monitoring systems. And the way they seem to work is uh, they're stationed. They take a heat signature video of people walking past. And when there's an individual spike based on what temperature it's recording, we can ask that person to step over and maybe do an on, on-site um, temperature check or check for other symptoms. So it's a way to passively check large gathering areas. We feel that's probably more responsible than expecting these young men and women to self-report or self-test. Uh, we'd hope they would do that responsibly, but we're not sure. But this is more robust, but as Susan said, it's quite expensive. The smallest uh, system is in a $6,000 range, and, and the, the larger that can monitor larger crowds is um, in a $25,000 range. And I will tell you that in the media um, and people looking at these things critically, they're not really sure about the efficacy. So they may work wonderfully as designed, or they may not work as great as they're advertising. So the, it's being worked out. Some of the manufacturers were challenged, but it looks like there are local vendors in Vermont that could potentially do a demonstration. We would ask for that, um, but that will be a significant financial outlay in addition to the, uh, the PPE that we're gonna give everyone masks. We're gonna make sure hand sanitizers around. Uh, we're going to um, you know, obviously do the testing that will be required and set by the state, but th that'll be a significant, significantly higher cost. Yeah, I, I can see that uh, that there would be a whole associated umbrella of costs. I think in my discussions so far with Senate leadership and, and appropriations, the, the argument that's most effective concerns the wave of out-of-state students who are coming back. So I had been thinking of it as the initial testing and quarantine at each place when that's complete, then from those discussions, it seems like people seem to feel more of the expense might fall on the institution. But for, for bringing in and making sure that there's testing initially, so the, the four million is probably more accurate for that, um, but not necessarily for taking the students through the whole year. Um, so I, Debbie, I think Ruth had her hand up. And, Let's send a perch like first and then yeah. Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for all the, the presidents. I think that's the one title they all have in common. So I'll, I'll use that one. We're, <laughs> we're trained so hard not to use first names. It's, it's pretty difficult. Um, but in my communications with the former president of Norwich University, i uh, come to the understanding that none of the private schools, colleges and universities in the state have have made use of the other COVID funds like that have been available to businesses. I, I was just kind of on the assumption that even though they're large businesses for the most part, that they were finding ways of, of making use of those other funds. And I think that's what's it, that's basically my question. Then I'll have a follow-up of of the presidents that are still with us. Like have your institutions been able to use any of the other programs to support the the deficits that you're facing? Yes, sir. This is uh, Mark Anarumo, the new guy I know, Rich. And of course, uh, Rich being active is wonderful um, for all of us. He's a, he, he knows what he's talking about, obviously. So we did, uh, our CFO uh, researched the potential for recovery funds tied to business operations. And each effort we, um, we laid out was met with a, uh, we, we don't meet the different criteria. So we're either too big or we're too small or we're not aligned correctly. So we did run that to ground and our CFO, who I do trust, that she also has a legal background, um, she was kind of, um, she was told that we don't meet criteria. But, but we appreciate that as an, we did pursue, pursue that pretty aggressively, even when Rich was here. And the others? Yeah, in the interest of time, uh, Mark said it well, I'll just say ditto for Champlain. Yeah. Okay. And maybe the other two presidents have gone on to their other tasks. Yeah, fortunately, the other two presidents had to leave. Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, this is a higher education, and the, although we consider that a business too, those grants don't provide funding for the type of testing uh, that we're looking at through this funding, the COVID, you know, the CARES Act, and the money that was specifically designated for these types of expenses. Uh, and also, I just want to remember, point out also that, um, so we have the initial testing in the fall, the students go home at Thanksgiving break, they come back in January, they're gonna all need to be retested again. 
So that's another reason why this money probably wouldn't cover all that testing. Um, and, you know, again, it's probably good to test more than just once uh, to make sure that nobody's infected and that, uh, you know, it doesn't seep out to the community. Yeah, and, I, and your testing staff, and if you have uh, athletes in sports, they're going to be going out and maybe having contact with others. So, yeah, uh, I, I encourage AVEC to look at that $4 million number more closely and, and make sure that we're we're fully supporting the, the, the testing and the PPE that's required. And uh, it, at least for me, it, it helps to know that they, there wasn't any other funding that these institutions received. I think as they all said, they're so important to our communities. Uh, and I'd like to, see, to make sure that we can at least support them 100% in, in this cost, because it's so obviously connected to the, to the COVID and the CARES funding goals, that if there's a way to if the, if the need is greater than $4 million that we meet that need. Thank you, Senator Ingram. So I think Senator Hardy was next, uh, and then Senator Baruth. Yeah, thank you, Senator Ingram. Um, the, the, when I um, reached out to Susan to get an estimate, um, we, she and I talked about the cost of the initial testing for each student to come back, as Senator Baruth mentioned, plus the associated sort of initial PPE costs of bringing students back. And that's what the estimate, which I'm, I'm looking at now, is, is 4.43 million if you test the 23,000 or so students who are in the independent colleges plus 750 as an estimated PPE cost. Um, and then our committee discussion last time, we sort of rounded it down to 4 million um, just to get a sort of number we thought that the appropriations committee might go with. So that's how we arrived at the 4 million. I would think that their testing costs throughout the semester would be higher and their PPE costs would be higher, but this was at least an attempt to uh, try to support that initial return of students. Um, and also just to note, Susan, in terms of the CRF money, that has to be expended in full by December 30th. And, and actually we moved that to December 20th um, so that we have 10 days to wrap up the things and move that money into the unemployment insurance trust. Um, so we wouldn't be able to use this money to fund testing in the next semester. Unfortunately, there may be additional congressional funds in the fall that would potentially address that depending on what happens. But this would just be for the first semester because of the limits on the funds, um, um, which is unfortunate. But um, so I guess uh, I would love to be able to cover more costs, but this was an, at least an attempt to, to, to pri provide some support for the independent colleges and some equity and how we're looking at higher education across the state. Yes, thank you. So, so um, as somebody who teaches uh, college uh, classes, it's never made that much sense to me that we go home for Thanksgiving and come back essentially for a week and a half or two weeks. Um, now with COVID, it makes zero sense. And in fact, UVM has canceled the, um, the post Thanksgiving piece uh, mm -hmm. in person. So everything that happens after Thanksgiving when they go home is remote. So they take their finals uh, online, et cetera. So UVM will not have that second wave coming back from all over the country. I would, you know, I, I know we're getting late in the planning phase, but it, it seems to make very little sense to me for any of these institutions that we're talking about to put themselves in a position where they need to do essentially an initial screening again when the students might only be here for two weeks or, or something like that. So I would, yeah. I would push strongly to you know, put that uh, on a remote footing post Thanksgiving. I, I, I don't know, um, especially with uh, the testimony that a half a million dollars might be necessary to do a last round of testing. Senator, you're uh, no, we're just, and we agree uh, with you. Uh, none of us is, none of us is, uh, is uh, returning uh, after oh. the Thanksgiving break. So you're spot on. That's where we oh. are. Okay, I, I thought I understood the discussion of testing to say that somebody said that they would need to be tested again when they came back after Thanksgiving. 
Uh, I was referring to it when they came back in January, but the money doesn't oh. cover that anyway. Just, just to clarify, um, two institutions, one being Sterling, a small amount of students will stay, uh, they will not leave Vermont at Thanksgiving break, and then they will come back to campus to do some special outdoor program. And Bennington is also uh, probably gonna keep a small amount of students on campus uh, after, especially their international students who won't be flying home. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's reassuring. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, definitely. So, uh, if does anybody else have questions, uh, Senator Perch? I don't have. I don't have questions for the for the witnesses. witnesses yeah. So okay, just, committee discussion. I guess. Senator I just. Had, I'm sorry. I just had one uh, other question. Um, I mean, this may be for Susan. I'm not sure. I'm. Um, a lot of colleges are starting to come out with their their plans and, and yesterday Middlebury College did. Um, and a lot of people are disappointed that it doesn't include any plan for de-densifying the campus and sort of changing the schedule so that um, there's maybe three semesters or three trimesters and they bring back two thirds of the students at, the time, at a time. A lot of colleges, a lot of independent colleges around the country are doing this. Bowdoin introduced plans to do that, Oberlin, Grinnell, um, so there are a lot of institutions that have done this, and I'm wondering if any of the Vermont institutions are doing this, um, I mean, including UVM, that it's relevant for even a larger institution to try to have fewer students on campus in, in the dorms, and if that's been considered, um, because I think there are many people in Middlebury who are hoping that that would be the case for the Middlebury plan. My understanding, I didn't haven't read uh, through all of Middlebury's um, guidelines is that they are going to at least stagger the return um, and so that they, the students all won't be coming back on the same day but I think you know all the students do want to come back uh, but they are looking at ways of de-densifying de 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 the dorms and seeing you know if they can have one student uh, so tr looking at those we are still waiting for guidance from the state so uh, we have submitted some recommendations and we haven't gotten guidance yet from the state as to what they would like us to do. So that will also be key, uh, but certainly that's been part of the discussions uh, as how to keep social distancing, not only just in classrooms and the dining halls, but in the residence halls as well. And Lori, I don't know if you want to talk about perhaps what you're doing, at, thinking about at Champlain. We're none of the, everybody who, including Middlebury, qualified uh, what they released because we are still waiting for the state guidance. So it may change. Yes, and just to speak briefly to our, our efforts at Champlain, we are uh, we are more aggressively de-densifying uh, in terms of classrooms and residence halls. Our academic plan is uh, based around a flex hybrid uh, course model, which you may have read something about in the uh, if you've been paying any attention to higher ed press, um, there are a number of institutions that in addition to changing the calendar uh, and staggering the return or only returning uh, some of their students, um, a number of institutions are like Champlain uh, designing from the get go to allow for remote access to a virtual college experience. And so for us, what that means is investments in uh, higher quality cameras, for example, um, to make sure that students who either can't or do not want to return to the in-classroom experience can still have the full Champlain experience in real time. So different than a, an online program uh, like we do it with our other adult learners. Um, so the way that Champlain has approached it is really through that course design to make sure that we achieve the same kinds of goals. Um, we are being, as I said, quite aggressive about the de-densifying of res halls. Um, and just to give you a sense of how that plays out, what that means for us at Champlain, um, we have over many years uh, come to a really proud point of housing most of our students on campus um, through the, the cooperation with our neighborhoods to make sure that we were being, being good community members and taking responsibility for housing more of our students. So while we've made wonderful progress there, um, we are, uh, as you know, if you've driven through our neighborhood recently, um, we are pretty dense uh, in, in, in this neighborhood. And so being able to de-densify 
both our own res halls, which are normally full to capacity, and move out a little bit into different community facilities where we can house more students in a spread out format, um, frankly, only increases the urgency for us of the testing um, protocols at the beginning of the semester because students will be even more mixed with our community than they are under normal circumstances. We do expect, uh, based on what we're seeing so far, we expect somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of our students um, to come up with some modified option and not to return uh, to campus in the full schedule uh, that we would normally see. Um, so we do expect fewer overall. Uh, but of course, part of what um, part of what we also are, are reckoning with is how many folks, and you all are seeing this in other places, how many folks want to come to Vermont because of how well we've done. Right. And so threading that needle of being welcoming, but also insisting on the public health is, is very much part of what we've been navigating. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I, I think that might be uh, all the questions we have for our witnesses. Uh, and I want to thank you all for taking time out of your schedules and especially Susan Stitely for putting uh, Senator Hardy on to this so that she could put the rest of us on to it. Um, we will have a little committee discussion now. You're free to stay if you like, but um, most people usually drop off because it's not scintillating. Um, so in any event, nice to see you all and thanks again. Many thanks. I, Appreciate I your time. Want, I really want to thank the committee for considering this and taking the time. It's very appreciative uh, that you're thinking of the private colleges, um, and uh, we really uh, are help, grateful for your efforts. So thank you. Absolutely. You're here. Thank you, Susan. Thank uh, you. Thank okay. you. Committee, um, we are, I believe, this is our last meeting pre-break. Um, and part of the reason I say that is, um, I don't know if you have noticed, but I, I have noticed, we've gotten nothing from the house. Um, they have not generated, other than the date change on Act 173, we have not gotten anything from them. So um, even though I had had discussions with Kate Webb about um, our priority bills as recently as uh, some weeks ago, they, I guess they've been just focused on COVID and other things. Be that as it may, we're not in the normal phase of the end of a session, which is we would be dealing exclusively with house bills. And we've moved all of our stuff over to them. We've done the work on the Q1 budget uh, the last piece really was this, uh, that is the money for testing for independent colleges. Um, and just to finish that, I'm wondering, since I came in half an hour into the testimony, is there somebody who would volunteer to write a letter on behalf of the committee to the Joint Fiscal Committee? In other words, it doesn't have to be long, it could be a one-page letter, just outlining what we heard in the testimony the ask in terms of the amount, and then it would come from all of the committee members who agree to sign on to it. Um, it is the sort, okay. I'm happy to do that, yeah. <laughs> you saved Corey. <laughs> and I'm assuming you want me to send it to everybody first before, or would it come from you, Phil? Should I, how, uh, how do you want the process? If you, if you draft it and send it to the committee, we can send you back a quick email comment, and then you can just list our names in the order they appear on the uh, on the website. Okay, great, yeah. Uh, and no um, you know, so so the emphasis would be on uh, again the fact that these out of state students will come in a wave, and that is a a potential public health threat to the rest of the state unless we are wise about how we use the COVID money. Um, so I, I, I think it should be a high priority. And the, the idea would be that the committee agrees with that. Um, and then if you, you know, break out who we heard from on it and maybe just a, uh, a highlight from each of their testimony, that would probably be enough, you know, maybe four or five paragraphs. Okay, um, no problem. And Phil, did you, yep. the, I, 
I think you were copied on most of the exchange this morning with Senator Kitchell. I did see it. Yeah, and and her thought was that the Joint Fiscal Committee would deal with this even in our absence and not to include it in one of the bills right now. Yeah. Um, because a final decision about whether or not colleges are gonna open is actually hasn't been made by the governor yet. Is Was that your understanding of where it was at right and, now? And that's the thinking behind them having a letter sitting on, on their desks when they meet. Okay. Um, because we won't be around and um, it, it might be that Senator Kitchell would remember what we're talking about, but she's got a lot going on. So I, I wanna make sure that there's a formal request to the to JF, oh, no, JFC. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, and Senator Perchler. And in that letter, can I advocate that it be the higher number, the $5 million number, or do we feel like there's a danger if we say 5 million, we get zero and not sort of a... I would be for five, Five million. They they'll do what they'll do, but I think it's better to be a little more realistic. Um, and in fact, in the letter, Ruth could cite some of the figures and say they turned out to be slightly higher than our original discussions indicated. Um, so sure, I can put a table in it. <laughs> <laughs> Knock yourself out. <laughs> you gotta use different colors too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's very persuasive. <laughs> so the the other thing is, um, Tim sent out a spreadsheet this morning. In the chairs meeting, he um, I'm not sure if it, maybe it just went to the chairs at this point. Yeah, because I haven't seen it. <laughs> okay, it's the house has been working on putting out some more COVID money before we leave, and and so it's. It's mostly around economic development, ag, um, uh, non-education non stuff. So I went through the list. There was nothing that fell into our purview. Um, that's what I think some other committees are gonna be doing over the, the end of the week is looking over those request numbers and giving recommendations to appropriations. But our chunk of the money went out in the Q1 budget has a has a fence around it um, and it'll be the the remainder of it will be divvied up in August so um, we don't have that work to do so uh, you know other than me working through Tim to work through Mitzi to get the House Committee to work on some of our bills <laughs> um, is there any anything else that I'm forgetting that anybody uh, is wanting us to do before the break that couldn't be done in August. I just have a question about, um, I was looking through, I don't remember, I think it's eight, H966, I don't remember all the numbers, but the, their big package that has a bunch of housing, broadband, economic development stuff. There is $12 million in there for summer meals for kids. Yep. And, um, based on what the testimony we got from this, the Secretary of Education, my impression was part of that 50 million that we put in the, the first quarter budget was supposed to go for that purpose. I think yep. he said 10 million, and I think I supported you his testimony that he gave in the House. So I don't know if that's something we want to just get confirmed or not, or not, but that seems to be a double. Not that yeah. I don't think that we should give more money to meals. It's been something I've advocated for a lot, but it seems like it's double counted in the math. And maybe Jane has already figured that out. I don't know, but that was one red flag I saw. Okay. And I'll make a, a, a note to talk with, uh, because it's not really clear. I do that, Debbie? No, well, I was just going to say, um, we just approved health and welfare, um, a, a letter to approach that includes $12 million that's supposed to be assigned to AOE for summer lunches, so summer food programs. Okay, so then, I mean, it, all right, I, I will double check and just make sure everybody's aware that Dan French did indicate very specifically I, I, 10 million was I, what I remember him saying. Yeah, that's what I remember too. And I think I sent an email to Bobby and Ginny and I think I copied you too, Phil, just yeah. saying, hey, we got testimony that the secretary said 10 of that 50 million was going to summer lunches. Um, 
I think I did that right after his testimony because I thought yeah. that would save us some money, but apparently it didn't. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that, my understanding is they need more. They need more. Um, that was that was what the impression that I got uh, that they told us in health and welfare, which is why we put it in our our well, budget. Twenty two million dollars is a lot. <laughs> that, would, that would be a lot. So, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it needs to be sorted through, but I don't well, think time was enough, though. <laughs> I will talk with those three people. The, the other thing is this will all go through the normal process, so we will all have it on our radar screen and make sure we get the right answers before we, before we vote. So in other words, when we talk about it in caucus. Or, um, and I just want to say, if it's found money, I want part of it for the arts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the arts is uh, is is in the is in the spreadsheet that I saw this morning. Yeah, they get they get five million. Okay. I was advocating for ten for the arts. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Headline will be Hardy takes money from school kids to give to the arts. True. <laughs> I don't want that headline, especially after all the advocacy I've, I've done for school lunches. But yeah, the you know, same. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. And so, the off the backs of uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so not not hearing any uh any thing else that we would have to do my assumption is th then that we will not meet thursday and that this will be our last meeting pre-break that would only change if something comes from the house either money wise or policy wise or a bill that we have to deal with before before we break um but otherwise we'll you know, turn to our other committees and we'll follow the um, this particular thing we just mentioned through the regular process. Um, I, I wanted to make sure I say two thank yous. First is to Jeannie. Um, Jeannie, can you show yourself? Hi. And the second also showed himself, which is Jim Demeray. Um, <laughs> I really, really want to thank the two of you for jumping to the virtual format. Jeannie, I know you were um, you were uh, at the beginning, you were scrambling and you picked it up in record time. Um, and Jim, thank you also for keeping us even keeled in terms of um, ledge counsel through all of this. Jim and I developed a, a a, text, a secret testing system for the floor so that I could appear more authoritative than I actually was. Um, so thank you both very much. And I, I also want to thank, thank the committee. Um, I've been on the education committee for 10 years. N nothing remotely like this. Um, you know, we've just never had this kind of disjointed uh, crash of the whole system. And this committee, like every other continued got our work done. As I said, everything that we did this year made it over to the House. Um, whether they act on any of it, we don't have a lot of say in, but we um, got all of our priority bills over there, including things that were not such big priorities, as well as did the budget work and other, other things. So um, thank you so much. And uh, uh, I will see you in Zoom calls between now and Friday or, or whenever we break, but um, but that this will be it for Ed for a, for a little while. Can I can I say something, Senator? Please, Jean. So, um, as usual, <clears throat> it's really it's really been you all have treated me so well, and it's been such a pleasure to to work for you and with you. And Senator Baruth, you really make my job doable. I really appreciate that. Um, Jim's been tremendous help for me. And I want to wish the best to Senators Ingram and McNeil because I guess this is so yeah. long. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I wish yeah. you both the best. I think and Jim's going to be more fun than I am. <laughs> well, I have, I have to say, like, when I first heard that they had made the voluntary decision to leave or to pursue other things. I was like, I'm, I'm not at that place, but I kind of am now. <laughs> like, you know, after this last couple of months, I, you know, I can see why so many people are retiring. It's like, 
it, it really took a lot out of everybody. Um, but um, Senator McNeil, we will have his brother running soon. So we'll, we'll have an identical twin. Uh, and My wife wants to do a write-in for me for independent, she said. <laughs> She's got to get me out of the house <laughs> for 40 years. <laughs> Now I have to know: Is do you really have a twin, or is this some mythical joke that? No, no, with? it's for real. The joke oh, was a triplet: Jim, John, and Joe. But it really is Jim and John. Wow. <laughs> Joe I've still was never seen them together. Our but... imaginary triplet. All right. Or guardian angel. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thanks again. See you all Thank soon. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.